I would like to introduce our third speaker this morning, who is Dr. Anne Alexander. She's an economist who directs univers the University of Wyoming's international programs, helping send our state's young people all over the world for experiences that change their lives. Um, initially from Cloudcroft, New Mexico, Anne did her BA and her MA at New Mexico State University, and she did her PhD in economics at the University of Wyoming. Anne works in policy economics, often with a focus on energy. In Wyoming, Anne has served on the governor's nuclear energy task force, and nationally she served as a science and technology policy fellow for the State Department in the Bureau of African Affairs. Anne's um, favorite book is Ray Bradbury's Halloween Tree. Her favorite albums are U2's Rattling Home and Nirvana's Nevermind. She's a dog person. Her dogs are a German Shepherd, a lab hound mix that apparently bays and bays and bays, and a Rottweiler that's mixed with all that Anne would reveal, something much smaller than a Rottweiler. I think that's all she knows about her Rottweiler's pedigree. Um, Anne has such a good tranquil life, and yet in her talk today, she is committing to delve into one of the most controversial uh, topics in America's current public life, which is healthcare reform. And I think we do all agree that it's such an important topic, and yet the national discussion surrounding um, the Affordable Cal Health Care Act and Obamacare has gotten so loud and so angry that sometimes it's hard to know even what it is that we're talking about. So I know that Anne's clear thinking um, will be a tonic for us all in these loud days on an important subject. Please welcome Anne Alexander for her talk, Obamacare, the sound and the fury and the economics. <laughs> Mostly the economics. I told these guys that what I was going to talk about was a surprise, mostly because, I mean, I'm here, we got Buffalo Bill, and we got superheroes, and we got insurance. And what I'd really like to spend most of the first few minutes on is talking about how we got here, and I don't mean um, in the last 10 years, I mean like way back in the mists of time when the colonists first got here. And I just have these patent medicine things up here because they're, they're great. Uh, there were... These violate the laws of science for sure. These are all sorts of interesting things that people were supposed to be able to take and go from looking like that to looking like that. So, um, so how did we get here? Honestly, I think it's kind of really, it's really important for us to understand that um, we didn't just magically get this weird patchwork system that we have that now is supposed to be being reformed by Obamacare or the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act, depending on, on which lexicon you want to use. Um, so, so let's talk a little bit about how we got here. And um, when America's first settlers came from Europe, we had very few to no formally trained physicians. And I'll talk a little bit about why that was in just a second. Treatments were mostly derived from word of mouth, like patent medicine. Women mostly did the treatment of the ill in the home. They took care of the kids, they took care of the husband, they took care of themselves, they took care of their mothers, uh, and they treated illness with homemade herbs, concoctions. Um, chemistry wasn't really part of it. Um, other parts of medicine as we think of it today were not part of it until probably a couple centuries later. The English system that primarily dominated uh, in British North America well, we imported part of it. This is what it looked like in England. You had physicians. They were university trained. They were fancy people. They did not generally do uh, a whole lot of treatment of patients. They would uh, perform uh, surgeries sometimes in a theater. Um, but these were sort of the, the ultimate um, trained elite medicinal kinds of folks. Then you had the chemists, the apothecaries, and these were the folks that evolved eventually into pharmacists. We didn't really have many of these at first either. What we had in spades were, was this great part of the profession here called chirurgeons. Yes, chirurgeons, which evolved eventually into surgeons, but after a very long period of time. You know all those 
crazy old stories about the, the psycho barber that kills somebody. Um, yeah, that's what these guys were, okay? <laughs> these are the guys, they were, they were barbers and they were surgeons. So they'd shave your neck and then if you need a little surgery, they would do this. They did not go to medical school. Um, they did not know chemistry, but they did do apprenticeships. And these were, even in England, not terribly regulated and certainly not here when they first arrived in the New World. Um, after a few decades of settlement, there were um, some physicians that came to the New World, to British North America, but most of the surgeons, uh, the, the chirurgeons that showed up here um, were, as this gentleman says, quacks abounding like locusts in Egypt. So, they, you, I mean, basically they are not eminent for their skill. In other words, we have a bunch of crazy barbers running around trying to treat people with patent medicine. Um, and mostly what they're out to do is make money. Um, we did start introducing medical training. You know, this is like 100 years after the British arrived. So we finally set up a couple, more than 100 years actually, set up a couple of medical schools for actual physician training. The first one was um, the College of Philadelphia at the University of Pennsylvania. The second was what is now Columbia University, King's College. But almost all of our medical providers were um, apprenticed surgeons, barber surgeons. And so highly unregulated, highly unstructured. Medicine as a profession was not anything like it is today. Much, much different, much more informal, if you will. The American Medical Association was one of the very first sort of regulatory, if you will, structures that popped up around healthcare. And they were founded in 1847, so we're still looking at 100 years after the first medical training showed up in this country. Um, the only thing that they could really agree on doing was to improve <laughs> education in medical school. They could not really agree on anything else. So medical practice had not been transformed by things like uh, Coke or uh, penicillin or any of these interesting new things that were going to come along um, within you know, about 50 years of this date. But essentially, um, so Pasteur, Coke, all of these, Lister, these folks had not come along yet. So all the, the, the American Medical Association, the first sort of regulatory structure that tried to impose anything on the chaos of healthcare, all they really did was um, try to come up with a common set of standards for medical education, for physician training. Also, there were no nurses, by the way, <laughs> right? Nurses didn't really come along, nursing as a profession didn't really come along until much later in this century. There was some nursing that was developed during the Civil War, um, the Napoleonic Wars and so on, but it was still not seen as a reputable thing for a woman to do, to be a nurse, and it was always women. So here's our first sort of regulatory structure. Um, but medicine was never seen as something you did to be rich or prestigious or wealthy. You usually had another job. That's why surgeons were barbers too. They had to, have, they had to make money. Um, and physicians did not need hospitals. We had, well, I'll talk about our first hospital systems in the United States in a minute, but essentially, if you needed the doctor, I mean, if you think about any of the movies that show, say, for example, uh, the, the Civil War period or the post-antebellum period, it's always like the doctor comes to your house, right? You don't go to the hospital for any sort of medical condition. And you certainly, well, you almost certainly don't go to his office, right? You, you, they come to your house. They come to you. And um, if you didn't have a doctor come to you, you weren't as, as as sick, so you just had your hired help take care of you. Um, I think I already said that, so I'm gonna skip that slide. Hospitals, hospitals, this is what hospitals were. I don't know if you can see this for the glare, but this up here, that is a, a picture from Idaho City, Idaho. It says pest house and county jail, because they were the same thing. Um, a pest house was where you sent the folks who had communicable diseases that probably were going to be terminal. So that's where typhus patients went, people with TB, um, smallpox, pest houses. So pestilence is what that stands for. Um, and yeah, you usually threw you know, the, the, uh, the local miscreants into the county jail with them. Um, almshouses were a form, kind of, of a hospital. 
So, you know, in pest houses, you could be, uh, almost all of this is palliative care, if you will. So you're dying from tuberculosis. Nobody's really treating you for it. You're dying from smallpox. You're probably not getting treated for it. Um, almshouses were, um, well, we all think of them as the place where you send the poor in uh, Charles Dickens' novels. But this, this is where you just basically put the homeless and the aged. And then eventually you start seeing people who are difficult for families to take care of the mentally ill, orphans, the blind and deaf. Um, and eventually you started seeing single mothers sent there and it, abandoned children and so on. These are very sad places, all right? Here is the Erie County Alms House in New York. Um, the only real, honest to God, hospital we really had in this country were the ones that were established by the Seaman Act of 1798, signed by President John Adams, um, and essentially, the, the idea was to give these, these noble service people a place to go and to be taken care of when they were disabled in battle or in service or as they were dying. So there was some treatment that took place in marine hospitals. It was mostly, as it says here, for merchant marines, U.S. Coast Guard, Coast Guard and other federal beneficiaries. So marines could go there. Um, if you um, go a little bit later into the um, 19th century, you start seeing also old soldiers' homes that start to be um, established in the same model. But, <coughs> one sec, one sec, one sec. <coughs> sorry, Allie, I just coughed into Allie's ear. Um, but the one thing all these places have in common, you go there to die, right? You don't go there to get better, you go there to die. So this is not, this is not what we think of as hospitals. Hospitals for us tend to be seen is a place where you go to get better in most cases. Um, to folks up until the, the 1900s, the, the 20th century, this was a place you went to die. As um, sanitation and our understanding of things like microbes um, increased, uh, you did start to see hospitals being places where you began to treat issues, where you began to treat illnesses. Um, but this really is a 20th century phenomenon. So healthcare has always been kind of this disorganized, crazy, crazy thing um, for most of the history of the United States and pretty much for the most of the history of the world. There was very little regulation of it. And the payment for your medical services, very, very rarely um, did it have anything to do with Blue Cross, Blue Shield, or Cigna, okay? That's pretty darn, it's incredibly recent. The very first insurance schemes we started to see in this country all kind of um, coalesced around the early part of the 20th century. Um, the first one that I know of, although I know I've heard of some other anecdotal evidence of some other areas of the country where things like this happen, but it was basically um, a, a collective of lumber mill owners and their employees that got together with a doctor in Tacoma, Washington. And um, for 50 cents a month, so that was kind of a premium, you could have basically unlimited access to the healthcare services offered by uh, the doctor that was on hire. Um, there was a rural, for, uh, rural farmers cooperative health plan in Oklahoma that began in 1829. And basically, this was a little bit different model. You bought a share. And with $50, you were putting money towards the capital facilities construction fund of a hospital in Elk City. And um, in return, with your share of stock, you could access all the health care you wanted once the hospital was built, and until then, from the doctor that was coordinating this plan. Um, Baylor University is often given credit for being the very first one that used what we think of as um, the kind of premium plan that still mostly exists today. This was for their faculty, for the teaching faculty at the University Hospital, and eventually they knocked it out to everybody that taught at Baylor University. And it said, as it says here, it was capitated, and it was, that means a per patient fee. And eventually capitation comes to mean um, per patient per illness, <laughs> okay? But at this time, it was a prepaid fee per patient. It was given to the hospital, and it, so it was basically put into a reserve account. And the hospital used these premiums, these capitated payments, to then spend out as they treated people who worked at Baylor University. Um, this is what evolved, this is what Blue Cross Blue Shield turned into eventually. 
So Blue Cross Blue Shield evolved from this very first um, Baylor University hospital plan. Kaiser Permanente is a very famous one. It's not as big in this part of the country, but I always really think this is a fascinating story. In the Kaiser plan, this was, this, this was in the early 1930s, um, they had prepaid or capitation payment, so they split it apart. So you could either do a lump sum prepayment or you could do a per person um, payment for your employees. Um, this was all an employer provided insurance policy. The Kaiser Permanente Insurance Company was the first to have a, a, basically a very formal um, employer sponsored insurance program. Now who was this Kaiser? Who was this Kaiser dude? I always think this is really interesting because Kaiser, Henry J. Kaiser, um, who had, who, you know, maybe if you ever look at any kind of healthcare stuff, the Henry J. Kaiser Foundation is a big deal, but Kaiser Permanente is a well known name in healthcare. What did this guy do? He built all of these giant dams across the West, and he built Liberty ships for World War II. And he had, therefore, massive workforces. And he wanted the people that were doing the concrete work on the Grand Coulee Dam to be able to get treatment fast and quick and effectively and get back onto that dam and make more dam, please, or to build more Liberty ships. He had this massive workforce and he wanted quick, efficient healthcare for them. So his model was as the employer um, to pay essentially a capitated fee or a prepaid fee to hospital or to um, doctors and that would, uh, that would provide them with ready-made medical care. This wasn't a completely new model because railroads did this and coal mines did this and a lot of other places did this. But they were on a much smaller scale. This man owned, I can't even remember how many billions of dollars of assets and had two of the biggest projects um, known to man in the early 20th century, the building of the dams and the liberty ships in World War II. Um, so the Baylor plan, the Baylor plan, as I said, moved into this Blue Cross Blue Shield model. This is how this came about. It was during the Great Depression that the Baylor Plan, um, you know, two or three years after uh, the Baylor Plan was established, became a broader network. And the Blue Cross part of the Baylor Plan was regional, so it was based on, you know, west, south, east, north. It was nonprofit, non-competitive, and they used what was called a community rating. This is kind of important because we don't use that, well, most insurance plans don't use this anymore. This is where the insurance was provided based on the territory that you lived in, not based on your own individual risk. And so in most cases, and I'll talk about this a little bit more in just a second, in most cases, your insurance premium nowadays, it is, um, it is determined a little bit by who you're employed by, and a lot by what you do in your personal life, right? So do you smoke, do you drink, do you exercise, do you eat right, do you get a physical that gives you a certain premium? Um, this is completely different. This is basically, you know, you live in Gillette, Wyoming, you all get the same insurance premium. Doesn't matter what your line of work is. Um, this basically spread that risk of having to pay out um, from the insurance company, from Blue Cross, across a large population and averaged out high risk and low risk professions. Um, this thing was controlled by physicians and hospital boards. It was nonprofit, as I said, and essentially what it said or what the philosophy behind Blue Cross was, was that if you pay your hospital bill, which tends to be really big, um, through your insurance company, you'll have enough money left over to pay your doctor. And so this was a way to get your doctor's bills paid. The next step in the evolution of health insurance in the Blue Cross Blue Shield network was Blue Shield. So the physicians started saying, okay, maybe we're not getting paid as much as we'd like, even with Blue Cross, so let's have a similar kind of program for payment to physicians. Again, they used community ratings, and what they would do is accept a low-income patient and have their Blue Shield payment, their insurance payment, cover their, um, their bill. And if you were a less, uh, if you were a more affluent kind of person, they would charge more than the Blue Shield payment. And so if you had Blue Shield and you were affluent, only part of your bill would be covered and you'd have to pay a little bit more. 
Um, again, they used a community rating. So this is the birth of the blues, as they call it. And it's not quite as you know, glamorous as like as St. Louis and places like that where they're playing horns. This is the birth of the blues, as in the insurance company blues. Not really that exciting. Um, <laughs> not nearly as exciting as they howl and wolf. Um, here we go. Now we're starting to see as, as these bigger kinds of insurers come along, Blue Cross, Blue Shield, Kaiser Permanente, we move into a world where some for-profit, I mean, my goodness, I'm, a, I'm an economist, I love capitalism, and you will always see for-profit folks coming along if there's some money to be made. And so people on the outside of the insurance industry, as it stood, kind of went, well, that seems nice, but um, you could make a lot more money if you did things differently. For-profit commercial insurers started popping up. And so what they did was focus on a couple of different things, though. Instead of um, taking in a premium, holding it in reserve, and paying it out directly to physicians and hospitals, they would do what was called underwriting. And that means that most of their workforce was dedicated to figuring out how much you should be paying for your insurance. Um, their goal? was to separate the low risk and high risk people. And so we start to move away from community risk ratings to what are called experience ratings, which is what we use now. So if you are a coal miner, you're probably gonna have a higher premium than somebody who sits behind a desk all day, right? Just because one is more risky of a profession. If you um, drink a lot, if you, um, you don't uh, exercise, you eat like crap, then they are gonna make you a high risk person. Um, but essentially, they, a, a lot of this had to do based on profession. Um, more money was made, uh, and still is, when healthy people are insured, because when you insure a healthy person, they pay in their premiums, they never go to the hospital or the doctor, and so you just keep their premiums. If somebody's sick, a high-risk person, they're paying their premiums, but they're also drawing on claims to pay to the hospitals and doctors that they're using. So you want as many healthy people as possible in these pools, and employers with healthy workers could therefore get better deals. Um, this, of course, puts pressure on Blue Cross and Blue Shield, so they start evolving their models towards a more for-profit kind of uh, model as well. Now, so that's kind of, I'm sorry, that's a little bit fast and furious, and um, there's the history of the insurance industry in one fell swoop, but, Everything, all hell breaks loose right now, though. Let me just tell you about this. This is the most interesting and weird part of the entire story. Of course, World War II, all hell broke loose anyway, but it really wreaked havoc on the concept of um, insurance and healthcare in general. Because what happened during World War II was that um, we had to very tightly control the allocation of resources. Almost everything had to go to the war effort. And we also needed to control inflation. We couldn't have prices just spinning out of control because that's a sure way to have domestic, um, uh, oh, what's the word I'm looking for, uh, insurrection. <laughs> okay, so this stupid war, I hate it, look at the prices are going. We wanted happy, well, as happy as could possibly be domestic people. And so inflation is a bad thing. Inflation can be a very bad thing when it's out of control. So these wage boards, were set up to basically um, control inflation by not allowing employers to give um, increases in wages year to year. And um, one of the reasons that employers really needed to give higher wages year to year was because the workforce was being depleted more and more. Because guess what? All the guys were going off to fight. And all the women needed to be attracted into the workforce. And so the way to do that was pay them more. Wage board says, no, you can't do that. So employers, some smart, I wish I knew who even proposed this. I would like to throttle them or shake their hand. I'm not sure which. But they said, OK, if we can't give higher wages, we'd like to introduce this wacky new concept called fringe <coughs> benefits. Fringe benefits, you know, retirement, health insurance, little things like that that people will earn and they'll be sitting over here in another pot and if they get sick they can use the insurance and when they retire they can get their pension. Oh my god, all hell, hell breaks loose now folks because health insurance becomes entrenched at this point as a premier benefit. 
It's not something they just did during the war. It then becomes part, part, of, the, part of the whole sort of reason we're in the mess we are today. Um, the federal government says, that's a great idea. That's wonderful. And you know what? We like it so much, you are not going to have to pay any taxes on that. All right? First of all, you're going to be able to say the premiums that you pay on behalf of your employees are tax deductible. And um, for, the, for the beneficiaries, for your employees, those benefits are not going to be subject to the payroll tax. So tax-free benefits for everybody, basically. That eliminates organized labor's opposition to employer-based insurance. Organized labor had not been a fan of this before. Um, the unions took an eye at that after World War II and said, hmm, that sounds like a really good idea. If we can't get higher wages, maybe we can get higher benefits, retirement and health insurance. So unions won the right to include health benefits in the collective bargaining process. And this ripples out to the other non-union businesses because now they got to compete with these crazy fringe benefit things going on in everybody's uh, hiring packages. So they have to offer health benefits and a retirement package and raise wages to compete with the unions. Um, and this means that employer-based insurance just explodes. Um, now this is, I always think this is funny. So um, there are many presidents that have, um, that have proposed in reforming some of this stuff. So Teddy Roosevelt was the first one. He said that we should have a single payer national health insurance. He was watching some of the things going on early with uh, the farmers and the lumber mills and so on and saying, we should all do this. Um, he was told that that was a bad idea in no uncertain terms um, by the Democratic Party. Um, President Truman comes along a few years later and proposes, again, sort of a, an all-encompassing single payer plan kind of thing. And um, it was called a communist plot. Um, a, a few years later, Lyndon Johnson, before Medicare and Medicaid, had bounced around the idea of having a single payer insurance, social insurance plan, and it was called a communist plot. And so you see there's, there have been lots and lots of presidents who have tried to do this and gotten shot down. Truman was the most spectacular shoot down of all of them, though. He was just absolutely savage for this. He had very little influence, and most of, his, most of his efforts were focused on the invasion and fighting in Korea. He did, however, have one big win in his, you know, in his hope to reform the health care system, and one was this Hill-Burton Act, which designated federal grants and loans for hospitals. So we started to see, at this point, a huge growth in the hospital system. Um, but essentially, what all this leads to is this down the line. As employer-based health insurance becomes the norm, you start to see an evolution of um, those who can, those who are employed by people who can afford to offer health insurance and everybody else. So not all employers, particularly small businesses, have a, can, can offer health insurance. It's very, very expensive to cover your employees. To this day, it is. Um, those who are self-employed often could not afford to do it either. Because what happens in the kind of model that has evolved now is that the number of people in your pool of employees, that tells you how many people you can spread the risk over. And the smaller that number is, the more giant your premiums are going to be. Okay? So we were talking on the plane up here about the Wyoming Humanities Council. You have eight employees. They're not part of the state. They have to go out into their little person of eight pool and find an insurance package. And to this day, it's very, very expensive to do that. At this time, before Medicare and Medicaid had come along, the elderly, of course, were having a difficult time, especially if they were no longer employed, if they've retired. Um, also, they have incredibly high health risk factors. They're going to need a lot more care, a lot more medicine, a lot more of everything. So it's very expensive to treat the elderly. They were having a hard time accessing health insurance as well. And then the poor, obviously, were not going to be able to afford it, even if it was offered to an employer, because they may not be able to afford it out of their wages. Um, President Tru sorry, Johnson, just talked about Truman. That's Johnson. Johnson, this guy right here, um, everybody probably remembers the Great Society programs. Um, the signature program within the Great Society was the Medicare and Medicaid programs. Medicare is um, providing insurance coverage for the elderly, 
who could no longer afford to pay for it on their own. And Medicaid is for those who are below the poverty line. And so this was one of those, so you're, you're seeing the patchwork evolving, right? You're seeing first, it's mostly employer sponsored. Now we're gonna try to shore up this hole here and this hole here with Medicare and Medicaid. But there are still a few holes. So this is, this is evolving into a really nasty place, folks. Um, now, my favorite topic in all of health is the charge master. You guys read Bitter Pill? Anybody read that article? Oh, Lord, you should read. I will talk about it in just a sec. Read that. There is this marvel known as the charge master. Is anybody in here in healthcare? Oh, you know what the charge master is. Oh, my God. That's because nobody knows what the charge master is, and yet it influences our medical costs in this amazing thing. So in Medica as Medicare and Medicaid were put into place, what happened was hospitals were going to be made a paid a reasonable cost based on a formula um, for um, reimbursement of Medicare payments. Physicians were going to be paid fees that were reasonable, customary, and in line with those prevailing in their community. And because the government was going to be doing that, Blue Cross and Blue Shield also followed suit, as did most commercial insurance companies. What's happening at this point is that now you've got the government coming in. And they are saying, we want to do something that's reasonable, in line with your cost, in line with your community cost, blah, 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 blah. And now physicians, and hospitals especially, have to say, so in other words, I need to have a list of prices. OK, because I don't usually really have a list of prices. I sort of go, OK, every year I'm going to need to make this much money, and this is how much I charge people, and this is how much I charge their insurance companies. But essentially, I have to come up with a retail list of prices. And at the hospital level, this is the most insidious part of all of healthcare right here. It's nothing, not that the hospitals are not evil. This is not a bad, you know, they're not bad people. It's just that this, this thing comes up. It's called the charge master. And it's exactly what it sounds like. It's a master list of retail prices. It's how much you're going to charge people. Master list. And, oh boy, this just leads to all sorts of havoc. Now, um, I'm going to skip that real quick. So what, what the logic of all this is that, he's going, hmm, that's how it's supposed to work. Um, we're supposed to have with Medicare and Medicaid and the, the, all of the hospitals being built and a whole bunch of physician education programs and so on, we're going to have more providers of health care. Therefore, more competition and decreased cost. But as the 1960s and 70s evolved, that didn't really happen. And a lot of that simply had to do with, well, charge master and a bunch of holes in this system. Commercial insurance moves towards this system where contracts are based on um, negotiating with hospitals in particular and other providers in their networks um, to have lower negotiated rates than what they show in their retail list of prices. So my, my employer is self-insured, but they have an administrator called Cigna. So the University of Wyoming's administrator goes to our health network, our provider network, and they say, OK, Ivinson Memorial Hospital, um, you have to give us 50% discounts off of the retail prices. And the hospital says yes or no, or they negotiate. That's basically how these things work. Medicare and Medicaid, there's no negotiation. There are fixed rates based on federal and state formulas. And so here's what happens. People who come in who are covered by Medicare or Medicaid are paid a fixed rate. Or not, they're not paid. Their hospitals are paid based on this fixed rate. People who come in who have employer-sponsored insurance come in, and their insurance company has negotiated a, a rate. The coverage or the, the insurer is going to pay for that rate. And then maybe we have a copay, deductible, stuff like that. But anybody that doesn't have insurance didn't have somebody come in and say, we're paying you this. Anybody who doesn't have insurance walks in and gets paid, gets charged retail price. And here's the problem with that. <laughs> now you've got the people who have no insurance coming in and getting charged the highest price. The thing about Charge Master is, though, if you talk to any hospital administrator, I was on our board of trustees for our local hospital, so I know this to be true. If you ask anybody in a hospital how the Charge Master prices were derived, like was there a market analysis, 
Did they hire a bevy of economists or statisticians or accountants or business people to come in and look at their costs and you know, figure out a profit margin and all that? They're like, no. It was printed in the 1960s and we inflated at 2% every year. That's, hmm, that's a little bit disturbing. Okay, so you end up with this huge gap between the prices that are charged and the prices that are paid. So I'm, I said you should read this article. This is a great article because this talks about this very problem that is the most insidious part of all of our problems. It is the fact that um, the charge master rates or pretty much the retail rates in most of medical services are charged not based on some sort of market analysis, there's been no competition, no supply demand analysis, there's just this crazy retail book called The Charge Master that nobody knows where it came from. And that is how medical bills are killing us, essentially. And the people that pay that high retail price are the people who have no insurance company negotiating on their behalf. So yeah, that's a red flag, because I'm not kidding. That really is the biggest problem in our medical, in our medical system right now, in our healthcare system right now. So, um, how are we doing? And I look at Peter to make sure that, how am I doing? How much time do I have? Oh, okay, super. So, we are spending 17 cents of every dollar in the United States on health care. So, 17 cents of every dollar of our gross domestic product goes towards health care. What is that buying us? Um, well, it's buying us very high um, health insurance premiums. So here's our total expenditure on health as a percentage of GDP. And that's gone in 1980 from about 9% of GDP. Not too bad, it's not too far off from uh, Australia, France, some other places. Now it is up to about 17% of GDP. Um, over here, these are um, spending on per capita um, health insurance premiums. And you can see that's risen at a, an alarming rate. We're that red one on top, by the way. And what is it buying us? Well, we have the absolute best medical universities in the world. We have some of the most astounding healthcare research and medical research on the planet. Amazing. And this is something to be proud of. We have the highest five-year survival rate um, for breast cancer. We have um, survival rate for colorectal cancer among the best in the OECD, which has developed uh, European countries and us in Canada. So we have an amazing system of medical research, and we should be incredibly proud of that. That's where we're first. Unfortunately, we're also first in some bad things. For example, um, we had 2.4 practicing physicians per 1,000 people compared to the rest of the countries that we're compared to, which is 3.1 practicing physicians. A lot of that has to do with specialization. A lot of our doctors are not GPs or internal folks or those kinds of you know, general, generalists. They are um, specialists. And that is because it is very expensive for them to get an education. And so my brother's a doctor. He's one of those crazy people that's a GP, but he is always just so annoyed with his friends that went on and became dermatologists. He's like, oh my God, all of their medical school that is paid off and mine is not. You know, so there's a lot of that. Um, the number of hospital beds in the US, 2.6 for 1,000 um, population versus 3.4, so we have a shortage of um, providers. We have a lower life expectancy at birth um, than our, many of our OECD countries. It's 11 years lower than, than the average OECD countries, 15 years in Japan. And um, the average American lives 78.7 years, uh, one year below the OECD average of 79. So it also costs us a lot more to get basic medical processes. Angiogram on the United States costs $914, in Canada, $35. In a colonoscopy, about $1,200 versus about $700. You can see those numbers. They're all magnitudes higher in the United States. Much of this because we do have this sort of thing called a charge master. <coughs> infant deaths per 1,000 births, we have 6.8 uh, infant deaths per 1,000 live births. That is far and away the largest among developing or developed countries. 
We have a large number of medical mistakes that are made, mostly because our doctors, the general practitioners that we do have are highly overworked because there are not enough of them. There's 32 um, lab errors per, uh, per person in the last two years. Percentage of adults who had access problems, this means cost access, so they didn't go to a doctor, they skipped a medical test, um, they didn't fill a prescription because of costs. We're the red one over there, again. So, uh, just more depressing numbers, I'm gonna skip them. So, <laughs> so, all right, so, I think what, what I just spent most of this doing was not talking about Obamacare. What I spent most of this doing, and this is why I wanted to do it, is to talk about this thing was kind of, it's not in the best shape it possibly could be. We have um, hardworking professionals who go to school and become healthcare practitioners, nurses, doctors, um, uh, nurse practitioners, all sorts of people. We have um, people who really want to help other people. We have insurance companies who um, are good business people who are trying their darndest to, you know, to make this whole thing work. But something's broken down. And a lot of it is because we had this evolution of weird patchworks. So this thing, Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act, or Obamacare, was intended uh, to try to fix some of it. And this is what it was supposed to do. Now, I cannot comment on whether it's been successful in particularly this stuff over here, because this is much longer term stuff over here. This is uh, you know, educating more doctors and improving quality and efficiency and things like that. Um, over here, we're very early days in things, so it's hard for me to say whether things are working on this side, but we can at least look a little bit at this. Covering more people, having more benefits and protections, and lowering costs. Those are the three things that I can probably be looking at. Over here, I can't say, all right? That's why I say, hmm. I ain't so sure we've set that up within Obamacare. I don't actually think we have. I think that's one of the big limitations that Obamacare has is that it's not tackling medical costs at all. But are we going to cover more people? Are there more benefits and protections? Well, those two things are supposed to be tackled by this Medicaid expansion, the health insurance marketplaces, <clears throat> and insurance reforms. And then that was supposed to be coupled with individual and employer mandates. We all know, we've all heard the sound and the fury of the mandates, right? So employers, um, over 50 employees, have to buy a certain level of protection for their employers or their employees. If you don't have an employer-sponsored um, program, you are supposed to go on to the marketplace and buy, and you're all looking at me like, is she going to talk about that part? Yes, I am in just one second, um, <laughs> and buy insurance, so that's the mandate. And there are some insurance reforms, and then there was Medicaid expansion, which also got a lot of discussion too. In, um, in Medicaid expansion, what the whole package was the, in this this law was that we were going to, right now you get Medicaid, you qualify for Medicaid if you make 100% or less of the federal poverty level. And what this package of reforms was supposed to do was say all states have to expand Medicaid and everybody has um, to allow people up to 133% of the federal poverty level onto their Medicaid program. Those who make above 133 percent of the federal poverty level and don't have employer-sponsored insurance go on to the marketplace and they will qualify for subsidies to pay for individual insurance plans. You got all that? Yeah, it's much simpler now, isn't it? Um, anyway, okay, <laughs> and, but the Supremes, they came in and they screwed everything up and they said, well, yes, the mandate's okay, you can do that, you can do that because it's a tax or something like that but you can't force the states to expand Medicaid. They do not have to do that. So this totally blows up the incredibly simple plan that I just outlined to you. Um, meaning, so now there's going to be people between 100% of federal poverty and 133% of federal poverty who won't qualify for subsidies, who are the poorest people who are telling to go over to the marketplace and get insurance policies, but they have no subsidy. Okay. We're causing more problems, by the way, with that. 
Um, Wyoming, of course, is one state that, that decided not to expand. This is as of October 22nd because it's always in flux. Different governors change their minds. Every once in a while, Georgia just changed their mind. They went from being a red no to a blue yes. So these are the states that are not expanding Medicaid. Um, here are the sort of pink ones are those that are leaning towards not expanding Medicaid. The dark, dark blue are participating, and um, the lighter blue, they are considering an alternative expansion model. So Alabama, for example, is one. Um, let's see. The uninsured population in Wyoming right now is about 90,000 people. And what these, what these estimates show you is that we will continue to have about 90,000 uninsured people afterwards. Um, because we're not expanding Medicaid and because we went for um, participation in the federal health care exchange, which I could opine about on and on if you'd like me to, uh, but I won't, um, there's, um, there's, it's probably going to not change our uninsurance rate very much. Um, how those things are supposed to work is that the, the, health, the marketplaces, the health care exchanges, is that you are pooling your risk with everybody else who's uninsured right now. So right now, if you're uninsured, if you want insurance, well, I guess before October 1st, you would go and you would call and you'd call around and say, I need to get insurance, and you would be individually insured. Um, you, your premium would be based on a risk pool of one, which is you, and when there's only one in your risk pool, your premium is going to be pretty high. The idea behind the exchanges is that you get a bunch of people who are uninsured together, and they, even with experience ratings, they're all going to have lower premiums. Okay, that's the idea. Um, there are supposed to be, as we, as I said, three models. They're either run by your state, there's a partnership, or they're federally facilitated. Wyoming went with the federally facilitated one. The websites are supposed to help consumers shop and apply, um, and there are credits and subsidies that you can get from 400% of the federal poverty limit all the way down to 133% of the federal poverty limit. Um, their open enrollment began October 1st. You're supposed to have everything starting by January 1st. They just announced that they are going to give the, the deadline a little bit of an extension to March. So. Um, Zoics is the only way I can describe what's happened over the past couple of weeks. Um, the state-run exchanges have been doing fabulously well, Kentucky being an example. Uh, the state has a small number of uninsured, sort of like us, but they decided they wanted to run it their way and find their own, you know, the firms that they thought would be best suited for Kentucky. And so they've had about 30,000 people enroll. Um, Wyoming, on the other hand, went with the federally facilitated exchange, and we've had 30 people enroll. And we have two plans offered on the site. And that's because we didn't have anybody out there recruiting for us. I already said that, I already said that, I already said that. Let me look at this. So, um, as I said, up to 400% of poverty level, the shoppers on the marketplace don't have to spend more than a certain amount of their income on insurance premiums. So the higher up you get on the income scale, the larger, you, the, larger the amount is that you have to pay for your insurance policy. So um, even though you get a subsidy up to 400% of, of the federal poverty level, it becomes smaller and smaller. Okay? The way this thing is set up right now is that someone who earns about $11,500, that is someone at the federal poverty line. And they are, according to the rules of the uh, um, ACA, expected to spend no more than 2% of their income on health coverage. And that's $19 a month. Um, if the insurance plan charges more than that, this is how you can think of the subsidies, the federal government will pick up the difference. They'll, p they'll pay for it. So for Wyomingite, um, we have two providers that are in the market and they each have three plans, so there are six plans out there. And if you were to pick the silver level plan, which is the middle one, um, the premium is $743 a month. If you make the federal poverty level, you're expected to spend no more than $19 a month on that insurance plan. That means that the subsidy will be $724 a month. 
or about $8,500 annually for the subsidies. So that's how it's working. Um, there are a lot of questions. Wyoming is getting a lot of attention as to why we had so few companies come in. Um, it's a lot of it has to do with we have a small uninsured population. Another thing I think is because we didn't really have anybody out there in our corner looking for insurance companies to come because we did turn it over to, to the federal government. And we have only been able to see 30 people go through the entire enrollment process. Lots of people have tried to sign up. For example, I logged in and it crashed <laughs> three times. All right, so, I, but I was doing it just to, you know, come up with numbers for you guys. And then I found another guy that did this. So I just went and stole his numbers. It was great. Um, does it tackle the root of the problem? No, because medical costs are still rising at the skyrocketing rate. Um, are there unrecognized challenge for Wyoming? Yes, because we still have the biggest problem in Wyoming being untackled, which is the fact that we are, for the most part, considered by the um, Department of Health and Human Services to be a medically underserved community. 19 of 23 counties have um, a shortage, a health provider shortage um, that's fairly severe in primary care physicians, in mental health, and in dentistry. And so this did nothing for that. So if we need, if we're, if the truth be told, this is nice. I want people to be able to buy insurance because they need it, obviously. Access to insurance is access to health care. But I don't see that this has done much for either Wyoming or to solve a lot of our most insidious problems. So that's all I have. I probably went over. I'm sorry. So four minutes, actually. And uh, after any questions anybody has about the Affordable Care Act? Why aren't they? Uh <laughs> well, what's the question? Why aren't they addressing the charge master? Yeah, why aren't they addressing the charge master? Um, that's a really good question. I don't know. They do need, somebody needs to talk about reforming that piece of how things are charged. Um, and probably the people that do it would be the Medicare and Medicaid administrators because they're the ones that have the most when it comes to talking to hospitals. Um, but it was, not, it was not discussed as part of this. The ways that they went about in the bill of trying to attack medical costs was to try to, and this is not a bad idea, to try to make it so instead of charging per treatment, people should start thinking more about charging based on outcomes. So do I get well or do I not get well? Um, to have a medical home um, instead of having you know, if you've ever gone for any kind of test, like I just had a back issue a few months ago, and every different office I stopped at had to do the same thing over and over. Let's do an MRI, let's do this, let's do it. And I'm like, I already had this, don't you people talk to each other? And that, you know, the costs are just skyrocketing for my insurance company and for me, even though we already know what the MRI says. This guy had one done and he read it. So, um, so hopefully that will help, but no one, has attacked the charge master issue just yet. But it's a great question. Yes, sir. If Wyoming is so fiercely independent as a state, so we believe it's suggesting succession from the federal government? That's an excellent question. Um, I, I was, uh, I, I helped provide some numbers and analysis for the task force, the legislative task force that was looking at the exchanges in Wyoming. And um, Elaine Harvey was the chair, so she's, if you don't know who Elaine Harvey is, she's a right down conservative, lovely woman from Powell, and I absolutely adore her. And her, her, her argument was, at first she's like, oh, I just don't think this is a good idea, you know, it's, I don't like the whole idea of Obamacare. But then she started to think, why do I want the feds to tell us how to run this thing, we should run it the way we, we want to run it. The downside of having our own would have been small numbers. The upside of having our own would have been we could have tailored it to ourselves. So you're right, it was a little weird, in my opinion. I'm not a political scientist, so I don't know. <laughs> but, but to me, it would have made more sense given our culture of wanting. If we can run something, we should run something. And that's the way Wyoming tends to work. So it was perplexing, but I'm not a political scientist. 
Yes, sir. I mean, I could partially answer that. From inside the legislature, the reason why we chose as a majority to go with the federal program at this point was because we don't have any idea whether we as a state can afford this. And this allowed us to delay a little longer and then continue to The administrative look. costs of running it? Right. Well, not just administrative. The flat out costs to the state to pay for the pro health. So it's the biggest part. Health and labor is our biggest part of our budget by far. It's growing right. immensely. And we're not sure. And so well, by doing excuse me, by doing this, we were able to delay that while we could learn yeah. more. And the nice thing is, on the exchanges at least, you can change, you can watch and sit back and wait, and then you can say, all right, we don't like what you guys are doing. You can switch. So it's not like, and I think on Medicaid you can do that too. So it's not like, well, now or never. They had one deadline, and then they pushed it forward, and then they pushed it forward again. And I, I yeah, in all fairness, there was a lot of uncertainty as to well, does our administrator for this program have to be a state employee or can they be an independent contractor? We don't know, said the Department of Health and Human Services. Does it need to be, you know, can we allow interstate competition among, you know, the policies? We don't know. So they, in all fairness, they didn't get a lot of answers that they needed. Um, but I think, generally speaking, it probably would have been easier for us to administer, but the costs were up, for sure. Ladies and gentlemen, we are going to continue this conversation over lunch when we'll have a, a round table and, and we'll have access to all of our speakers. Um, so right now, I'd like to A, thank Anne one more time for our <laughs> Thank you all for attending this morning to invite you to a lunch where we can get together over food and, uh, and continue a what has been a really good conversation. So thanks everybody for coming.